Witnessing a pivotal moment in church history unfold before our eyes is a rare experience. The United Methodist Church, which boasted almost 6.5 million members in the United States in 2019, has decreased to under 5 million in less than five years. More than 1 million members and over 8,000 churches have either left or closed in that time, with many, many more likely to come. Wading through the timeline is difficult. News agencies only get to part of the story, but this is not a tweetable event. In the US, the denomination has not had one single year of positive growth in six decades, but this crisis that has opened the floodgates is far more recent. This is a short history up to today of the schism within the United Methodist Church. We don't need to travel that far back. From May 10th to 20th of 2016, the General Conference of the UMC, the lawmaking body of the global denomination, met in Oregon State. Every four years, the General Conference meets to revise laws and debate global denominational standards. And one disagreement that is always on the legislative floor is the church's stance towards homosexuality. Specifically, the performing of homosexual marriages and status of practicing homosexual clergy, which is disallowed. Paragraph 304.3 of the most recent Book of Discipline, which is the Constitution and the Law of the Global Denomination, states, The practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. Therefore, self-avowed practicing homosexuals are not to be certified as candidates, ordained as ministers, or appointed to serve in the United Methodist Church. The General Conference has the power to make changes to the Book of Discipline, but the voting body has always voted to remain traditional. This is in large part to the growing influence of Africa. When the full denomination formed in 1968, there were roughly 500,000 United Methodists in Africa and 12 million in the United States. By 2016, America had declined to a little over 7 million, while Africa had exploded to roughly 6 million. African delegates have the same voting power as American delegates and are far, far more traditional in practicing their faith. The UMC was on a trajectory to become a conservative denomination, rather than hold the usual vote, which likely would have been another traditionalist victory. A rather rare vote was held. The 864 delegates voted to authorize the bishops to create a commission to stop the infighting. That group was called the Commission on a Way Forward. It was to meet over the next three years to discuss ways for the denomination to get past the differences in theology concerning homosexuality. In 2019, a special session of the General Conference would meet and vote on proposed plans by the Commission and other groups, and choose one which would become the final global decision of law. Both progressive and traditional clergy agreed to what amounted to a ceasefire. For years and with growing regularity, many regions in the United States had often ignored or defiantly opposed the denominational law, ordaining and appointing openly homosexual clergy to churches as pastors. Progressives saw this as a matter of justice for their homosexual kin. Traditionalists saw this as anarchy, with laws holding no meaning. Traditionalists agreed to hold back from filing charges against homosexual clergy, while the Commission did its work of coming up with a way forward for the denomination. However, in July of 2016, only two months after General Conference, something lit the spark for the powder keg. The election of bishops in the UMC is a common event that happens every four years. In July of 2016, a clergywoman named Karen Oliveto was elected as a bishop by the Western jurisdiction of the United Methodist Church. The United Methodist Church is an egalitarian denomination, which means the ordination of women is commonplace. Women have been ordained as bishops in the United Methodist Church since 1980, with the election of Marjorie Matthews, so that was not the problem. The problem was that Karen Oliveto was in an open and practicing homosexual relationship. For traditionalists, this election was seen as an abuse of goodwill. The UMC had homosexual clergy, but never a homosexual bishop. Many traditional Methodist Christians from across the country were outraged at the election, stating that Oliveto was not an eligible candidate for bishop, let alone pulpit ministry. Likewise, on the continent of Africa, the outcry was perhaps even louder. The problem arises because bishops primarily have the power of appointment in the church. In other words, they choose which pastors go to which churches. This was coupled with significant questions about the teaching of Oliveto, who was already seen as far outside of the usual limits of traditional orthodoxy. A very progressive bishop who was ineligible for election was too much, and seen as bad will with the upcoming special session three years away. South Central Jurisdiction, less than 24 hours later, 
challenged the election of Karen Oliveto. This appeal sent her election to the Judicial Council, which is effectively the Supreme Court of the UMC. It took nearly a year for the Judicial Council to rule, and on April 28, 2017, they ruled that Bishop Oliveto's consecration as bishop was against church law. It would seem like a traditionalist victory, but the rest of the declaration led to frustrated traditionalists. The council also ruled that that bishop remained in good standing, and therefore would remain in good standing until an administrative or judicial process could be completed. Such a process would be handled by the Western jurisdiction if there was a complaint, which was the same jurisdiction that had just elected her as bishop. If this is hard to follow, allow me to make an analogy. Imagine if a judge was going on trial for wrongdoing, but was then declared as the judge in his own trial. There would naturally be a conflict of interest, right? This was the situation Oliveto found herself in, and the traditionalists felt as if the only point to challenging her election is that there was no point. The Judicial Council had agreed with traditionalists and declared there was effectively nothing that could be done about this illegal election. Oliveto's election sowed a good amount of distrust between traditionalists and progressives across the world. And as the 2019 special session of General Conference moved closer, more plans became apparent. I will spare you much of the debate, but in the final analysis, three plans came forward to the special session when it finally met in 2019. The first was the commission and the bishop's preferred plan, which was called, rather ironically, the One Church Plan. The plan essentially proposed regionalizing the Book of Discipline, giving areas outside of the United States greater autonomy, but limiting those areas from affecting decisions made within the United States. It was a live and let live policy. Even within the United States, the plan was to allow local churches or even entire regions of the United Methodist Church to have autonomy in deciding whether to perform marriages or ordain practicing homosexuals. The One Church Plan was widely criticized by traditionalists all over the world, which immediately pointed out that it was one church in name only. Traditionalists accused this plan as simply conceding the entire argument. What was the point of saying the United Methodist Church was a global denomination of unified believers if there was no unity in even what a pastor practiced and taught? It was a valid criticism, and perhaps an even more poorly chosen name that led to easy ridicule. The second plan, which was endorsed by traditionalists across the globe, was simply called the Traditional Plan. The point of the Traditional Plan was just that, retain the prohibitions that were already in place and to put in place stronger processes that would prevent similar situations like the loophole with Karen Oliveto from happening again. It had the overwhelming majority support of members from outside of the United States. While the One Church Plan may have provided greater autonomy, the global members instead wanted global unity on this issue, which was considered far more pivotal outside of the US. A third plan, the Connectional Conference Plan, did not have any wide support, and I will pass elaborating on it more for the sake of brevity. After a rather lengthy session of debate, the votes were cast, and the bishop's preferred plan, the One Church Plan, was defeated. The delegates instead selected the traditional plan by a vote of 56% to 43. It was seen again as a victory for traditional believers across the globe. However, realizing that there were irreconcilable differences, the special session also added a limited law to the Book of Discipline, which is called Paragraph 2553. This paragraph was intended to allow churches who disagreed with the decision of General Conference to leave the denomination with their buildings, assets and property. The reason this was a necessary additional step was because the denomination, all the way back to its founding by John Wesley, had adopted what is commonly called a trust clause. The trust clause, in short, states that local congregations hold the building and assets of a local church in trust for the local annual conference, which is the smaller regional body. Essentially, the denomination owns everything from the bell tower down to the hymnals of every United Methodist Church. There are many reasons for the trust clause to exist. First, the obvious, is that if a local church decided to just leave to join another denomination, they could not just do so and take conference property with them. It could be used to prevent denominational sniping or having a church run away with a rogue but charismatic preacher. Second, if a church suffered a catastrophe and all of the members were suddenly gone, the conference could come in and legally control the building without much fuss. Third, it can help to prevent frivolous decisions of a local church. For example, 
If a local church wanted to fund the new building of a brothel in a local area, the conference could shut the church down to help prevent it from happening. That may be an extreme example, but it certainly did give the conference power to prevent such an anomaly. 2553 was another olive branch, allowing churches a limited and specific way out of the denomination without having to leave the church building and assets behind. It was well-intentioned, but not without debate. The traditional plan delegates favoured what was called the Boyette Plan, named after Keith Boyette, a traditionalist leader. It only required local churches to have a simple majority vote of 50%, pay any still outstanding fees to the denomination, and pay pension liabilities to already retired clergy. The Judicial Council on Review declared that plan as unconstitutional, but it did not matter. What was instead passed and adopted as 2553 was called the Taylor Disaffiliation Plan, which changed several key factors. Instead of a simple majority, a supermajority of 66% was now required. It also required the payment of a full additional year of fees, along with the rest of the current years and any outstanding fees not yet paid. It required pension liabilities like the Boyette Plan, but seemed at first glance to be rather similar except with additional fees. It also required the vote of the annual conference to complete the process. It also seemed a bit strange, because progressive churches apparently were voting to pay more in exit fees. The reason would not be immediately apparent, as the traditionalists expected progressive leaders to begin the process of exiting the denomination. Paragraph 2553 would also give churches until the end of 2023 to leave, giving it a sunset date of December 31st, 2023. It did not matter. That very day, progressive leaders, including bishops and pastors, declared, We will not be silent. We will not be complicit. We will not leave. The church appeared to be at an impasse. The traditional plan had won the vote, but progressive leaders were again refusing to enforce the rules of the denomination, and there seemed to be no way to move forward. It is also important to note that 2553 would not be able to be used by churches outside of the US until after the scheduled 2020 General Conference that next year. That is not an important detail now, but it will be shortly. Things continued in quite a bit of tension through the rest of 2019. Then, in January of 2020, plans that had been brewing in the background surfaced. Methodist leaders who were traditionalists, progressives, and those who found themselves in the middle, often called centrists, revealed that they had reached an agreement. A rather famous lawyer, Kenneth Feinberg, who had helped to negotiate the 9-11 Victims Fund, took on the legislation and drafting process pro bono. What emerged was a proposed resolution, that is, a proposed law, to the 2020 General Conference called the Protocol for Grace and Reconciliation Through Separation. It was commonly called the Protocol for short. To cut to the chase, if the progressives were not going to abide by the General Conference, the traditionalists would leave instead. The protocol would have given churches the ability to leave and join another Wesleyan denomination if they could not, in good conscience, remain in a progressive UMC. The progressive and centrist leaders agreed to pay $25 million in seed money to a new traditionalist denomination, a concession for leaving. The plan caused a bit of an uproar among traditionalists initially. After all, why were they being forced to leave if they had won the vote at the special session? The reason was rather simple. If progressive leaders were not going to follow the discipline of the denomination, there was no sense staying, was the argument. After an initial burst of frustration, it was agreed upon by most traditionalists that this really was the only serious way forward. The signatures of well-known names from each side of the debate were included on the protocol, including 11 US bishops, as well as African traditionalist leader Bishop John K. Yambasu and Keith Boyette. The stage was set for General Conference to meet from May 5th to May 15th of 2020 in Minneapolis. But tragedy struck the globe. Covid. I will not recount that worldwide phenomenon for you, but suffice to say, the 2020 General Conference was postponed. African delegates would not have been allowed into the country, as travel was heavily restricted, so all sides agreed it was for the best. After all, it was only a year, right? In 2021, the hope of preventative vaccines was announced with much fanfare, but it was generally only available in the US, and travel was still heavily restricted. So, the 2020 General Conference was postponed again to 2022. This is exactly where things begin to get weird. On March 3, 2022, the General Conference was announced to be delayed once again. Not to 2023, 
but instead to 2024. This might not have seemed like a terrible issue, but the vote to postpone or move forward was starkly down traditional slash progressive voting lines. Progressives and centrists voted to postpone. Traditionalists all voted to move forward, even if it was a virtual meeting. Many international Methodist committees were meeting in person, and most annual conferences completed their work via virtual networking, so the precedent had been set. Four days later, Reverend Joseph Di Paolo, a traditional leader who was a member of that committee, resigned in protest. He revealed that the commission voted 14 to 9, with one abstention, to postpone, and how the voting lines were laid out. Another four days later, and Reverend Rob Renfro, another traditionalist leader and publisher of the strongly traditionalist magazine Good News, urged traditionalists to get out of the denomination if they could. The reason for the rush lay in the length of the delay. Remember paragraph 2553? That was set to expire at the end of 2023, and now the general conference was set for 2024. This appeared to traditionalists to be another attempt to manipulate the situation. Progressive and centrist leaders decried this worry as nonsense, but the ill will was already there, and traditionalist leaders were reasonably worried. Progressive leaders, if you remember, had already been accused of deception in the past. They were still actively electing homosexual clergy in many conferences, and had sworn not to uphold the rule of the special session of 2019. Further, Karen Oliveto was still serving as an active bishop, and no charges were being heard against her. Her election had also happened during the last ceasefire. In response to the General Conference's delay, on March 3rd, the very same day, the new traditionalist denomination announced it would launch on May 1st of 2022. The new denomination was called the Global Methodist Church. There was still momentarily hope that the protocol would pass, but traditionalist leaders were worried. They were right. On June 10th, 2022, progressive and centrist bishops said they no longer supported the protocol and would not be signers anymore. They cited long delays and the passage of time, as well as the changing circumstances, as reasons they changed their mind. This was seen as another betrayal. If signed agreements could just be broken, then what sense was there in crafting any agreement? The writing was already on the wall in hindsight, according to traditionalists. In February of 2022, the Judicial Council had ruled that annual conferences could add additional terms to those already laid out in 2553. This will be important shortly, so bear it in mind. Further, because of the protocol, many regional conferences had not significantly implemented 2553. Barely 200 churches had used the paragraph since its adoption in 2019, thanks to the protocol being believed as a valid pathway. With the hope of the protocol now seemingly gone, things went from tense to metaphorically nuclear, and traditionalist churches began to demand answers and pathways out, now believing progressive leaders were untrustworthy. Rather unsurprisingly, requests for information from churches and questions were submitted to the Judicial Council by the bishops. The first answer in May 2022 said that whole conferences could not leave the denomination as a block, only local churches. The Slovakia and Bulgaria conferences decided in defiance to leave anyway, voting nearly unanimously to leave the denomination for the Global Methodist Church. Those events are worth a short story in and of itself, as the proceedings were fascinating. Subscribe to hear that one soon. Some conferences moved quickly and began to ratify churches leaving. There were 180 churches that had used the provision at the start of 2022. The situation had become more tense through 2022, thanks to the February ruling of the Judicial Council. The initial reasoning, submitted by the New England Conference, was to check whether their requirement of an eight-month discernment process was a valid addition to 2553. The Judicial Council had ruled that conferences could develop additional terms. Some conferences took that knowledge rather liberally, and this is where the irony begins. What began as an olive branch for progressive churches to leave with their property became a metaphorical noose around the necks of most of the Methodist churches in the US. In many conferences, including sections of Maryland and California, this was interpreted to mean that conferences could require congregations to buy their buildings from the conference. This was obviously seen as additional bad will and not in the spirit of 2553. The original Traditional Plan's 2019 victory laid out fees that were far, far less. Even some progressive and centrist leaders decried this practice, but very few rolled back their decision to add excessive fees. 
In California in particular, this sent exit fees to soar. One church I checked with said their exit fees went from $180,000 to $4 million, roughly $60,000 per member of the church. In the Florida conference, the first major case to come forward, the conference required churches to purchase backdated hurricane insurance for their buildings for the previous three years. This would add multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars to their exit costs. The majority of progressive bishops added additional fees. The few traditionalist bishops did not, and in some cases helped to pay down the fees of churches that wished to leave. While 180 may have been the number at the beginning of 2022, by the end of the year, 2006 churches had left, and some had begun to pursue litigation over what they saw as a blatant power grab. Other conferences took a rather different approach, including delay tactics. In particular, the Eastern Pennsylvania Conference initially told churches to expect term sheets, also known as estimated exit costs, by the end of May of 2022. When the term sheets did not arrive, they were told the term sheets were forthcoming in July. Trusting their bishop, they waited for term sheets. In mid-August, those churches were then told they would only receive their estimated list of fees when they entered the process, and that they only had until September 1st, less than two weeks, to decide if they wanted to move forward. Fifty or so churches sued, as they had been asking for information for months, and claiming the conference shut down the process over a year ahead of the expiration of 2553. The bishop argued that judicial counsel ruled that conferences could add additional terms, including shutting down the process over a year ahead of time. In North Georgia, the first church to leave, Mount Bethel, agreed to a $13 million exit fee. At the end of 2022, the bishop of that conference shut down the entire disaffiliation process over a year ahead of time. When churches sued the conference, a judge awarded them their right to vote to leave, saying the conference had breached the contract that paragraph 2553 created. Some conferences did change. Western Pennsylvania's conference initially had an additional cost of 40% of a church's property value. After outcry, the conference changed it to 2%, but these instances were rare. Things only became progressively worse through this year, 2023. The General Council on Finance and Administration, or GCFA for short, the financial wing of the United Methodist Church, began to release aggregated data on church closures from 2019 to the present. Their first report, through January 13th, 2023, reported 3,266 churches had either left the denomination, closed, or had been abandoned. This same report also says 462,122 members had left by the beginning of the year. The latest report, from October 13th, now reports 7,585 churches have left, closed, or been abandoned. Over 1.1 million members were attached to them. Before churches had begun to leave in earnest in 2022 in the United States, over 1,000 members a day were leaving according to UM Data, the official statistical reporting outlet of the UMC. The number has nearly doubled since 2022. And what about the protocol? Africa still has hope for the protocol, but there is a problem, and it is in the number of voters. The numbers of delegates were based off of 2019 election numbers, back when it was believed a 2020 general conference was happening. The United States back then had nearly 6 million members, with Africa nearly matching those. However, America has 55% of the vote at the upcoming council because of the way the delegates were calculated. And now, the traditional votes have all left. Does that mean America gets less votes? Not at all. The Judicial Council ruled that elected delegates, voters to the 2020 General Conference, must be given their vote. Remember, however, the 2020 conference never happened because of delays due to COVID. It was delayed until 2024. Despite having millions less in membership, America will have 55% of the vote, and that vote will be disproportionately progressive because of traditionalist voters leaving. Conferences outside of the United States have also been told they cannot use 2553 until after the 2020 General Conference, happening in 2024, ridiculously a full year after the paragraph has expired. Also, Africa has not been allowed to elect new bishops when every jurisdiction has had the power to elect new ones so far leaving a greater power vacuum. Traditionalists have accused progressives of stacking the vote in their favour. Ironically, progressives have said, we're only following the discipline. Sarcasm proves to be a wonderful tool, apparently. 
That brings us roughly up to today, but there are a few additional things to note. Traditionalists have found themselves in a swamp they created. Progressives have suddenly decided to follow the discipline to the letter of the law when it comes to dealing with traditionalists. Traditionalists will not trust progressives to enact the law fairly, and progressives are telling traditionalists that they must trust them if they want to leave. Tens of millions of dollars of lawsuits are currently ongoing, perhaps hundreds of millions, and we witness church history as it unfolds. In a world of short paragraphs and YouTube shorts, it is hard to grasp the scope of the problem. I've had to leave out quite a bit of the narrative, because much of it doesn't fit neatly in the larger international story. Pastors are being asked to become politicians, when many of them only wish to preach. Many congregations know very little about what has happened, either because they have an ideological pastor, or one not suited to explain the long and complicated narrative that goes with it. As a church history channel, I have tried to connect the dots in a way that fits a chronological narrative, but honestly, many traditionalists are concerned about the timeline and ill will, and many progressives not concerned about the timeline at all, and only concerned about perceived justice for those on the margins. It has been hard to remain balanced. Nonetheless, I hope this has been informative, and I hope you consider subscribing. Cheers.